Hello. Formula One has been built upon sponsorship and advertisement for close to 60 years. Many brands have become famous in racing circles due to their association with the sport. Others, not so much. But there are a few that have become infamous because of what they represent, or worse, what they did to the team they were partnered with. Some never paid the money they owed. Others had shady practices in the background that caused them to bow out. But this specific story has to do with the behavior and flamboyance of its main investor. This is how a Belgian multi-millionaire dashed the hopes of a team that had potential. This is the story of Onyx Grand Prix and how it crashed and burned. Unlike the story of Life Racing Engines, which was unfolding around the same time, Onyx Race Engineering fought its way up the ranks of the lower formula ladder. It started out as Mike Earl Racing, named after its founder, Mike Earl. Its team merged with Greg Field's Church Farm Racing to form Onyx. The fledgling team entered the spotlight in Formula 2 in the early 1980s, running March customer cars with future Formula 1 drivers Johnny Cicado and Ricardo Paletti to some semblance of success. Paletti was snapped up by a Sella for 1982, and with the money they made with his sale, they entered Formula 1 in their own right as a one-car team, running a customer march for Emilio de Velota. They didn't qualify for any of the races they entered. It was in the cards for them to come back full-time in 1983 with a returning Paletti, but tragedy struck as he was killed in an accident in the Canadian Grand Prix. With their hopes of coming into Formula 1 dashed, for the time being at least, they returned to F2, where things looked great. March had outsourced their F2 works operations solely to Onyx, so they got state-of-the-art chassis, an engine deal with BMW, and a smattering of talent to work with. As F2 turned into Formula 3000, they reached their peak, winning the World Drivers' Championship with Stefano Modena. This proved to them that they were ready for the big leagues. Before they decided to make the jump, English real estate mogul Paul Shakespeare bought Greg Field's stake in the team, and gave it a big injection of cash that it needed to get to F1 caliber. They acquired sponsorship from Marlborough and a new thing called Moneytron, run by Belgian economist Jean-Pierre Van Rossum. Moneytron was less of a company and more of a thing, an idea. It was a supercomputer that allegedly was able to predict fluctuations in the stock market and, in theory, produce infinite returns on investment and outsmart the capitalist system. That sounds perfectly reasonable, doesn't it? Not a scam at all. The Moneytron firm got a ton of money through investment from many of Europe's rich and wealthy. Even the royal family of Belgium got involved in the fund. With the money they got from Shakespeare, Marlborough, and Moneytron, they signed veteran Swede Stefan Johansson and rookie Belgian Bertrand Gachot to drive the car. Gachot was a friend of Van Rossum's, so that's why he got the job. They struck deals to get Ford V8 engines, Goodyear tires, and the services of former McLaren engineer Alan Jenkins to build a car for them. All of this put together gave us the Onyx ORE1, a pretty nice looking race car with a livery that Autosport chief editor Nigel Roebuck called, quote, the most tasteless thing he'd ever seen. I have no idea what he's talking about. I think this thing looks pretty good. Onyx Grand Prix looked to have the right blend of youth, experience, wealth, and planning to be a promising outfit in Formula One, but first, they had to go through the growing pains that come with being new to the sport. Gasho and Johansson both failed to pre-qualify for Brazil, and then they destroyed two chassis at Imola, one in pre-weekend testing, and one in practice. But then, in Mexico, Johansson made the grid, qualifying in 21st, ahead of some pretty heavy names, too. The car's transmission died on lap 16, but still, they made the grid. But then, Van Rossum started being himself, for lack of a better term. For the US Grand Prix, he showed up in Phoenix with a brand new $20 million private jet. If this was a sponsor for a team like McLaren or Benetton, sure, no problem. But Onyx had just now made it onto a Formula 1 grid the previous race weekend. It looked a little suspicious. Why is their sponsor's owner slash ambassador spending money on a new jet and not, you know, making the team better? They finally got both cars on the grid at the French Grand Prix, with Gacho starting in P11 and Johansson in P13. After getting a front row seat to Mauricio Gujelmin's acrobatics exhibition into turn one on the start, they scored their first points finish that day, with Johansson coming home fifth. 
Everything seemed to be looking up for the team. But then Van Rossum opened his mouth again. He bought all of Shakespeare's shares and became majority owner of the team, and then told the press that he had given $40 million to Porsche looking for an engine deal. He then got on the bad side of the two most powerful men in the FIA by calling Jean-Marie Balestri a Nazi, which may or may not be true, and Bernie Eccleston a mafia boss, which I am 99% sure is not true. I don't think this guy can erase time. Or see visions of the future. Or is currently repeatedly... These comments got him banned from appearing in the paddock. They slid back again after scoring those points of Paul Ricard. Johansson failed to pre-qualify for Silverstone, and Gasho DNQ'd for Hockenheim. Both cars started the Hungaro ring, but retired after gearbox issues. After the Italian Grand Prix, Bertrand Gasho was fired for complaining about the lack of testing opportunities and not being paid. Onyx had allegedly been delaying payments on a salary that Gasho himself admits was rather small, and once he pointed all of this out, Van Rossum got a bit pissy and sacked him. It always be your own brothers that do you dirty. He was replaced by another rookie by the name of Yirki Yarvi Leto, who, for simplicity's sake, we'll just call JJ Leto. At the Portuguese Grand Prix, Johansson started the race in 12th, and by the end, Onyx Grand Prix had scored its first podium in Formula 1. Johansson had finished in third place through a revolutionary pit strategy. Well, <laughs> I say revolutionary pit strategy, but the truth is, there was no pit strategy. They just didn't pit the car. I have no idea how he managed to go 71 laps on one tank of fuel and one set of tires, but he did, and they got to spray champagne on the podium for it. Shine on, you crazy bastards. Van Rossum got more stingy with money after that, which is a decision that absolutely baffles me and had now become completely uncooperative, causing many people to quit the team. Peter Reinhardt took over as team manager after Greg Field left the team. On track wasn't much better. The team was struggling to pre-qualify again, although Leto did make his first two Grand Prix starts at Jerez and Adelaide. The team finished P10 in the Constructors' Championship with six points. Van Rossum was hell-bent on getting Porsche engines for the 1990 season. Onyx executives went to Stuttgart to talk to Porsche in the interest of acquiring some V12 engines to run for 1990, and eventually they agreed, but only on the condition that the talk was kept very, very quiet. But then, a few days after the deal was inked, Onyx got a phone call they really wish they didn't. Bertrand Gasho's manager of all people called the Onyx offices congratulating them on the Porsche deal. When asked how he knew about this, assuming that it was still being kept confidential, they were told that Van Rossum had just been talking about it on a Belgian news show. Naturally, Porsche called the deal off, and Van Rossum was so pissed that he took one of his Porsches to his residence's town square and set it on fire. The Porsche V12 engines that Onyx was slated to use instead went to footwork arrows. Back on the track, Leto and Johansson were retained for the beginning of the 1990 season, and then they showed that there really wasn't any improvement on the car. Both cars DNQ'd for the first two races of the season before Johansson left for AGS. By this point, Van Rossum had finally left the team, and 50% of the team was sold to Swiss car collector Peter Monteverdi, while another 25% was owned by Monteverdi's business partner, Karl Foytek. Johansson was replaced by Karl's son Gregor, who most of you would know as the guy that almost killed Johnny Herbert. Twice. With Moneytron gone, the pink stripes on the car were replaced by Granny Smith Green, and the logos were replaced with those of Monteverdi's car museum in Switzerland. The team was in such dire financial straits that Goodyear still hadn't been paid for the 1989 tires, and they couldn't afford to replace broken suspension pieces, which were just welded back together instead. Alan Jenkins had been fired after he had a falling out with my girl, so they lost their head designer. Most of the experienced employees quit in frustration with Van Rossum's arrogance before he sold off, leading to the drive shaft being installed backwards on Leto's car at one point. After that, Karl Foytek withdrew from the team, and after the season forbade his son to race in a car that he saw as a death trap. Things had gotten so farcical that Nigel Roebuck had begun to refer to them as Team Cuckoo Clock. Nigel Roebuck absolutely loved slandering this team. Both cars started the next four races, and Foytek was even on the cusp of scoring points at Monaco, but a late race crash with Eric Bernard's LaRousse relegated him to being classified in seventh place. 
Finances were still running thin, to the point where parts were being scavenged from Monteverdi's personal car collection instead of just buying them. After both cars DNQ'd at the Hungaro Ring, Onyx Grand Prix withdrew, with plans to come back after the end of the season. They even had a car design, but a lack of sponsorship made that endeavor impossible. Before 1991 began, Onyx Grand Prix had officially folded. Now, the team is dead, but the story continues. What happened to Van Rossum? Well, now the authorities were hot on his tail, as they were now beginning to figure out what was going on behind the scenes at Moneytron. The algorithm that allegedly powered this whole operation was never disclosed, but said that it took advantage of minute discrepancies in international pricings of goods. Financial analysts and investigators discovered that the firm's reported earnings were grossly inflated and inconsistent with market realities at first. When they dig deeper, they discovered that the whole thing was a cover for a Ponzi scheme. Van Rossum was taking the money from new investors and using it to pay old ones. As you know, that's illegal. Van Rossum knew the heat was on him, so he formed his own political party and ran for parliament, attempting to take advantage of legislative immunity laws. You know, as you do. In court, he said that Moneytron was founded as a way to, quote, fuck the system. He actually said this in court. And if he had the right funding, Onyx really could have been something. He was convicted of fraud in 1991, but didn't go to prison until his time in the Belgian Chamber of Representatives ended in 1997. Many of the things that he owned, including a yacht, a collection of 108 Ferraris, and two private jets, were sold to pay off any remaining debts. Van Rossum passed away in December of 2018 at the age of 73. Now how do you think it would have gone down in a parallel universe? Let's rewind. Let's split the timeline around when Paul Shakespeare invested in the team. Say the team gets sponsored by a more sensible multi-million dollar company. Stefan Johansson and Bertrand Gascho are signed to drive the cars, as is what happens in real life. While you may question why Gascho is still brought in since Van Rossum is not involved, you have to remember that in his lower Formula career, Gascho could wheel. It was only a matter of time before he got himself a Formula 1 job. They might have more success since money's being pumped in more consistently for car development, but let's just assume they end the year with the same point total as in the real world. Johansson leaves for Footwork Arrows immediately after the 1990 season ends, two years earlier than usual, and JJ Leto is drafted in to race in the second car alongside Bertrand Gasho instead of as Bertrand Gasho's replacement. As a consequence of Gasho not going to Coloni and then eventually Jordan, Coloni signs Gianni Morbidelli as their driver for 1990 and 1991, and Jordan hires Roberto Moreno to drive for them full time in 91, snubbing Benetton, who get their hands on Alex Zanardi. This also likely means that Gasho stays out of jail, but we'll get to that later. In this timeline, Onyx gets that new, better engine deal from Porsche or otherwise. More improvement follows year after year, and by the early bit of the mid-90s, say 1993, 1994 or so, we now have a mid-pack team that can fight with the likes of Ligier, Lotus, Jordan, and Sauber, while consistently beating the likes of Minardi, LaRousse, Terrell, and Footwork Arrows. Maybe Onyx fills the career launching point role alongside Sauber, or even replaces Sauber in that role. Maybe this way JJ Leto has a longer, more successful career in Formula 1. Maybe this way the second driver that comes in after Gasho leaves wins a few races, or even becomes a world champion. Maybe this way Gasho himself becomes a world champion, I don't know. So much stuff could have gone so differently had a normal company sponsored Onyx Grand Prix. Alright, hypotheticals are over, it's time for the aftermath. After he sold a stake in the team, Mike Earl and co-owner Joe Chamberlain attempted to buy the struggling Brabham team from the Middlebridge group, but the deal fell through. The Onyx name would attempt to come back in the World Touring Car Championship in the 2014 season, but it was aborted due to a lack of factory support from Ford. After this, Mike Earl retired from the racing sphere after 15 years in the touring car scene. Stefan Johansson would spend one more year in Formula 1 with AGS and Footwork Arrows before leaving for kart. The 1992 Rookie of the Year had a best race finish of 3rd four times and a best points finish of 11th in his 5 year tenure with Bettenhausen Motorsports. After his time in kart, 
he entered the endurance scene and won the 1997 24 Hours of Le Mans outright with Michele Alboreto and Tom Christensen. He won his class two other times. Bertrand Gachot would be one of the lucky few that drove the legendary Mazda 787B, winning the 1991 24 Hours of Le Mans with Volker Weidler and Johnny Herbert. On the F1 front, he would get a chance to drive with Jordan not long after Onyx folded, which looked to be his big break, but after an arrest for assaulting a London taxi driver, his big break turned into the big break for some guy named Michael Schumacher. He spent some time bouncing around back of grid teams before retiring in 1997. As was alluded to earlier, J.J. Leto would have a moderately successful, but ultimately short Formula One career, hampered by neck injuries. He forged a great career in the endurance scene after his F1 career stalled, and is now a two-time outright winner of the 24 Hours of Le Mans, and one-time American Le Mans Series champion. After Formula One, Gregor Foytek and his reputation for incredible accidents would make a few starts in the World Sports Car Championship in 1991, and then two starts in kart for AJ Foyt Enterprises in the flagship number 14 car in 1992 before disappearing from racing. He was allegedly supposed to enter in the 1992 Indianapolis 500 in the third car alongside AJ and Jeff Andretti, but decided not to because he was scared by the speeds. He now runs one of Switzerland's most successful Ferrari and Maserati dealerships. After Onyx, Alan Jenkins acted as technical director and or chief designer for Footwork Arrows, Stuart Grand Prix, and Prost Grand Prix before retiring after 2000. And so that ends the story of Onyx Grand Prix. It had a whole lot of promise, but a flamboyant, fraudulent investor shot everything down. What could have been a feel-good story of climbing the ranks and becoming a mainstay of Formula One became a tragic story of yet another Formula One reject. Thank you for watching. I have been Bobcat205. See you next time.